So good uh, afternoon, everyone. It's uh, I think it's 6 p.m. in UK time, 7 CET. It's uh, 10 a.m. here in uh, Silicon Valley. We are right right on time, and uh, the topic today is quite controversial, right? Uh, because you are going to tell us about what you think regarding the innovation. In effect, innovation is system is broken. Even digital transformation is broken. So everything is broken. So how can we fix it? I don't know if you're going to tell us a solution. And I but do have a solution that we'll get to within 15 minutes. I call it Core Edge. It goes by other names. It's been around in different flavors for, gosh, for probably 75 years. Um, but I'll lay out the argument. As I said, we, we're, we're bound to get interrupted here with a very loud noise soon. Um, and we'll see how far we get. That's Isn't fine. I'm pretty excited because I think, I really think the innovation system is broken. That's why so many companies are struggling. Uh, CEOs are struggling to survive, to future proof their organization. Uh, digital transformation from the CIO CTO perspective is also very hard, regardless of many best practices uh, in Gartner's and IDC's, everybody's still struggling. So I'm quite curious about this presentation today. Excellent. Um, are we expecting a few others or should we even try to just make a start before yeah, the let's, let's start. Usually people join uh, up until uh, 10 past, 20 past, so that's fine. Okay. So again, we could be interrupted any second by noise and I'll, I'll try to uh, shield you from that as best I can. So, so my name is Mark Zoaki. I run a boutique uh, consulting firm based in Silicon Valley. However, uh, the vast majority of my clients are in Europe. I formerly lived in Europe for a decade, uh, but my clients are the big multinationals in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, financial services, media, telco, retail, public sector, manufacturing, transportation, energy, chemicals, uh, you name it. I, I've, I've worked <laughs> with many uh, hundreds of companies uh, in Europe over the last uh, 25 years. I also uh, teach strategy and innovation uh, as, a, as an adjunct professor at places like Stanford, Wharton, INSEAD, and London Business School. These slides will also be available uh, if you would like. Uh, later, I can hand these out. Just find me online. Um, Hugo has my email. At the end, I'll show you. You can write me and, and get all these slides. Um, let's start with the financial perspective. Let's look at a 20-year period from January 1st, 2000 to January 1st, 2020. And over a 20-year period, there's not much too interesting about financial markets globally. Um, I put, a, I put a, a footnote at the bottom. We can talk about dividend policy. Uh, but for the most part, if you put 1,000 euros in the stock market uh, over a 20-year period uh, in places like the UK, France, Netherlands, Italy, and Spain, you're not getting your 1,000 euros back after 20 years. And I'm using this at a very high macro level to say there's a disconnect. We're pouring tens of billions of dollars a year into our big companies in, to say innovation, digital, and transformation but nothing's coming out the other side. They're not building billion dollar euro, uh, billion euro unicorns. They're not building large scale things. They're not building products and services uh, that are shaping the needle. They're not growing in other words, right? So the argument I wanna lay out today, they're really the flow of the next uh, 45 minutes or however long we have is one, what I call ITD, innovation, transformation and digital is, is largely not working. It's not delivering strategic or financial outcomes in large multinationals. Secondarily, that these uh, initiatives are largely incremental. I would say they're necessary, but they're insufficient. So yes, go do your incremental horizon one stuff. Um, it's easier to do. You don't have the, the, the pushback, but is it really helpful to those businesses longer term? And, and my argument is no. Um, so third, if, if you're in a large traditional multinational or you're an advisor or you're a consultant to these companies and, 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 and continued top line growth is important, uh, what I'll introduce on this call is a very new way of thinking about, about ITD, about strategic transformation uh, ITD. Uh, and then lastly, what I'm calling the, 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 the paradox of COVID, uh, what we've seen in the last few months is all industries are, are under fundamental change, right? We, we just look around us and uh, so many industries are under incredible change right now. But the paradox is the large organizations are, are holding back. Right now, they, 
They haven't prioritized innovation. There's been studies that say they've cut back in the last three months on innovation. Executive attention is elsewhere. They're, they don't have the financial resources to do it. Um, so we have this paradox of COVID, which is actually gonna make the problem worse in the next couple of years. So this is, uh, this is the hype slide, right? These big companies have a playbook of big dreams. They, they, they say they're gonna disrupt themselves before somebody else does. They open an innovation lab. They're gonna quote, reinvent the business. They do all these accelerator partnership programs and meet cool startups. They're, they're gonna change the company's culture. They're gonna be excellent at CX and, and design thinking. Uh, they're gonna open a CVC. Um, they're gonna become a platform company. And then they come up with all these silly titles like with ninjas and Sherpas and magicians and gurus and growth hackers. And, and then the favorite lately is, you know, they're going to build an exponential organization. So these are their dreams, uh, but they're not delivering on these dreams. Here's some external data and it's very disturbing. But if you look down the list, um, we have lots and lots of third party data points to say that, that, that large organizations are having difficulty, right? So uh, start at the top, 92% of large organizations, large multinationals cannot grow at 5% a year for five years in a row. And that's Rita McGrath, she published that in HBR in, in 2012. And we're currently redoing that research because it's nearly a decade old. Um, at any given time, about 32% of companies are under some severe uh, uh, economic threat, a TSR threat. I suspect that number has certainly gone up in the last four months. Uh, you may have seen some of these numbers from McKinsey. Only 8% of the executives surveyed believe their business model is going to remain viable. Go further down the list, 83% of digital transformations fail, according to McKinsey. Uh, go to the bottom of the list, uh, down at the, 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 the last bucket. 70% of employees have said they don't have the mastery of skills to do their jobs in the digital age. And 75% of managers are, are, are dissatisfied with their company's L&D, learning and development activities. Uh, and, and, and lastly, Gallup, I quote, only 13% of employees are actively engaged at work. That's the, the so-called Q12 survey. If, if, and, and think about this, if only 13% are actively engaged at work, are there enough people turning up even to innovate? So this is the backdrop of a lot of third party data, influential data points and people that, that begs the question, what's really happening? So I, I fly too many long haul flights a year. Sometimes it's a half, a, last year was a half a million kilometers a year on planes. And I, I believe the problem is really categorized in five areas. You have, you have structural problems. That traditional multinational is, is built for stability, reliability, predictability. It's built for this quarter, right? It, it focuses on the end of July, right, right? The end of June, June 30th. And then on July 1st, it starts focusing on September 30th. On October 1st, it starts focusing on December 31st. So it's, it's full of smart, but risk adverse people. If you're a FTSE 250 company, you're, you're focused on the short term. And we know this innovation stuff takes five years and we know that it, it tips the apple cart, right? So you, you've got these structural problems going on. You got organizational problems going on. Like I, we're, innovation often ends up in a CDO's uh, remit or a, even a CIO. Uh, these people don't make it into the C-suite. It's very, very rare that CDOs and CIOs, they don't have the career track to get into the C-suite. If you're an entrepreneur, so-called entrepreneur inside of a corporate, there's no equity or upside for you, right? Um, I don't think incumbents are, are attracting top quartile ITD talent, either at the new hire level or at the, at the more experienced level. Uh, they don't have the incentives in place to attract those people. And, and they will admit this when I talk to them. And of course, securing resources is, uh, for, for innovation is risky, right? Because people don't see the payoff in large organizations. We have all kinds of methodology problems. This is, a, this is a presentation of its own, but CVC and startup mating or dating, M&A, entrepreneurs, labs, accelerators, hackathons. I believe all these methods are largely broken uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And then we have all these behavioral issues. You can read through these on your own. Um, one of my favorites on this list, well, 
we all see no sense of urgency, of course. But I think large organizations, they also confuse a new idea with a great idea. And they hear an idea, and, and because their, 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 their field of view isn't so great, they think it's a great idea. But it's just to them, it's a new idea. And so they pursue new ideas, but the reality is they're not great ideas. And then lastly, I think you, we have a problem with consultants. And I'll be very direct. Um, most consultants don't fix the problem and get out of the way. They stay too long, right? And if you stay too long, I think you have an incentive to give adverse advice. You don't, give the, you don't fix the problem and get out of the way. And we have a multi-billion dollar innovation industry um, that likes to keep sending invoices, not teach somebody to innovate and get out of the way, right? So I, I think all of these things come together that, that are painting a pretty bleak picture about what's happening. Innovation, transformation initiatives, digital initiatives, culture, L&D, the labs, the startup engagement program, CVC, hackathons, every one of these activities is a means to an end. We're doing all these activities because ultimately we want to grow the business. That, that's the point. And whenever I talk to innovation executives around the world and I'm saying, how are you measuring your activities vis-a-vis -vis shareholder value, vis-a-vis -vis growth of the business? Well, Mark, that's too difficult. We can't measure that. You can't? Well, I'll come back in five years. And I do this with companies. I come back in five years. How are you doing? And, and the short of it is they, they, they've not figured. I think there's my alarm. So I'm going to have to uh, figure out how to mute out here very quickly. I'm going to show you these next few slides. We can maybe uh, discuss. And, uh, yeah, and then we'll talk. And then we can restart. Okay. Hey guys, feel free to say hello. So Mark is trying to destroy the consulting industry. <laughs> what do you think? So consultants don't help. What needs to, to change? Uh, is the innovation system broken? Um, would love to hear your opinion because I know we have some consultants and innovation managers in the room. Well, good, good evening. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy that I fastened my seatbelt. It is pretty hectic speech. So, um, and I, I mean, I've seen Mark before, so, um, that's, it's, it's pretty smart guy. So I'm, I'm really curious what comes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. Huh? <laughs> you, you, you've seen Mark before where uh, an event, an event? Uh, no, in a, in, a, in a webinar from uh, from one was from Deloitte and one was yesterday from uh, from some uh, I forgot the organization. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's a great speaker. Huh? Anyways, uh, that's that's for sure. <laughs> of course, and Mark Mark is still on, so we need to be careful. I'm <laughs> just oh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark went to a Deloitte webinar to tell that forget Deloitte in consulting. I think Mark they made an announcement, but they haven't sent the alarm yet, so I'm ready to mute again if I have to. <laughs> okay. Step right this class, and we keep the conversation going. And of course, I can hear you. And yeah. if you text me a question, I can even uh, type back. So let's keep going until we hear the alarm. I think big companies have four four choices: keep doing what you're doing, stop stop innovation and niches entirely because it really doesn't matter what you're doing. Save some money. Third, just give more money back to shareholders, or fourth, try something new. This, this famous quote, you never change something by fighting the existing reality. To change something, make the existing obsolete. So I'm gonna to propose to you an idea that's been around 75 years to make the existing obsolete. Big businesses around the world need to come to the conclusion, need to come to the realization that they run two different businesses. I have my day-to-day -day existing business. Let's call that the core business. I have shareholders. I promise them a certain return on investment. But as I said earlier, that business on the left is built for stability, reliability, predictability. It's focused on the quarter. It's full of smart people. 
but you're not going to change it. And there's no evidence, there's no real evidence you can change it significantly. Very, very few exceptions, uh, less than a handful. But it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to change that, that beast on the left. On the right, build a new organization, build something separate. And on the outside, the question becomes, how many new billion euro businesses can you build in the next decade to replace the declining growth on the left? And, and it's important that this is separate and only reports to the supervisory board and CEO. And it's also important that you integrate all buy, build, partner, and invest activities. Those are the four levers of, of innovation. Those are our four tools in our pocket. I can buy things, I can build things, I can partner in ecosystems, uh, and I can invest. And there's some case studies of this now coming out. So you run two separate businesses and, and keep them separate. Keep them separate. The idea that our minds for 30 years has been around like, like the, the, the corporate is this, this giant thing with lots of uh, synergies may not be so important. The idea, I, I'm rejecting the thesis that we need synergies between our business units. Did we all see the press release uh, three hours ago? Siemens is breaking into pieces. Siemens doesn't see the synergies in, in the holding. They're breaking up into several pieces. They announced that today, the supervisory board did. So on the right, you're creating, how many, can you create 10, 10 billion euro businesses in the next decade? Can you create three? And, and, and that, and they don't overlap. And I wanna reject the idea that we're gonna build something and then quote, bring it back into the core. This is the conventional thinking. Think about this. Why would you create a high growth asset, a high growth scale up, and then give it to that culture that's never managed a high growth asset that, that will kill it off? If I have a double digit growth business that's growing at 30 or 40%, the last thing I wanna do is give it to a bunch of career managers who spent 20 or 30 years inside the business that have never managed a 30% growth business. Makes no sense, but this is what we continue to do. So the ultimate goal is to build as many new billion pound businesses or billion sterling businesses as you can. And in the face of declining revenue in your core business, and I believe edge is your best opportunity to do so. Um, there's many case studies. We use the word skunk works, uh, right? Skunk works is Lockheed in the 1940s when a bunch of engineers said, hey, we have to go catch the Germans during World War II because they're, they're doing jet propulsion technology better. And the Lockheed engineer says, hey, we can't do it. We're stuck with all this structure and we're engineers and we're slow moving. And a couple engineers said, you know what? If you leave us alone and let us go move across the city and don't check up on us and don't make us run your processes, we can do it. So Skunk Works has been around for 75 years. That's where it started. Xerox Park, we know the story, right? They famously built a separate entity on the other coast, right? Instead of Rochester, New York, where Xerox is from, and Park is a 50-year-old model that continues to evolve. Philip Morris is exiting the, the tobacco space. They, they wanna stop selling cigarettes in the next 20 years. And they're gonna do that by, they've already created an edge organization to, to become, a, this is public information, to become a healthcare company. And I don't think they're gonna call it Marlboro Healthcare, but they're, they're going into uh, the healthcare space. And it's a fascinating uh, case study when you understand it, but that's being done in an edge organization. Orsted, the old Dong Energy up in uh, Copenhagen, they did the same thing when they went from a, a, a very old coal-based business that was domestic only to, to uh, Denmark to 100% green business it's 100% international, right? Uh, Alphabet has been doing this uh, with some success with, uh, with all of their uh, 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 moonshot projects, right? And by the way, Alphabet, remember when, when Google renamed themselves Alphabet, 
and that was very curious. They did that about five years ago. They went out to Warren Buffett and visited him in Omaha. And Alphabet is a, is a direct design of what they learned from Berkshire Hathaway, which I would argue has been the world's best investor over the last 50 years. It's a portfolio of high growth assets. That's all it is. Uh, AB InBev is, has their ZX Ventures doing, doing this uh, quite successfully so far. AXA has something called AXA Next. Um, and they put all buy, build, partner, and invest under a single entity, reporting only through to the board. Uh, and there's shades of this going on at GSK and Singtel. Uh, Apple did this twice. Uh, IBM has done it. IBM, remember when they built the PC uh, 35 years ago? They didn't build that at headquarters in Armonk. They built it way down in Florida. That was a, a Skunk Works style project, way away from the core. Uh, and we're seeing uh, examples of LinkedIn recently doing this. So, so different examples in different sectors. Many of these are European. They all have slightly different flavors. I show this idea to people and it's right around this stage that they say, hey, Mark, we're already doing that. <laughs> are you really? And so these are my criteria that I've created to use as a lens to say, okay, if you believe you're doing it, Let's use this as a checklist to see if you are or not. And then usually what they tell me is, well, we're doing three and the other, the other uh, five are aspirational. Or we're doing two and the other six are aspirational. But very few companies will tell me, Mark, we're absolutely doing all of those. As I said earlier, the idea has been around for a while. I'm, I'm trying to catch the intellectual growth of the idea. You know, we had Skunk Works beginning in the mid 40s. We had bootlegging um, from the 1960s onward. And then we had so-called outside in, which is a big movement. The ambidextrous organization beginning a decade ago, tried to take some of this on. Uh, and then more recently, the InnoSight team, which is formerly Clay Christensen's firm, um, they, they talk about dual innovation and they also think about the world as two circles, like I drew earlier, but they overlap and their view is they believe there's a lot of synergies between those two and, and philosophically I'm very different saying, no, no, they're, they're quite separate because if you get, if you get too close and those two circles overlap, the death star of the core business, the inertia and the physics of the death star will kill you every time. So I see, you know, I see innovation theater. I see my client, which is a very large European bank. You'd know them all by name. They do moonshots. And, and their first moonshot uh, was an app uh, to track expenses. And, you know, they said, hey, we did agile and we're doing all these things. Oh, I expect my bank to track my expenses. Um, it took them two years. It took them two years to even name the product. Because if they named it, including the bank's name, and it was a failure, oh my gosh, we, our banking name would be associated with failure. And by the way, over 30 executives were involved in this decision. And if they didn't name it, including the bank's name, and it was successful, then, oh my gosh, we don't get the branding experience of creating something high growth. So they, it was catch 22. They, you know, they, they, were, they were caught either way. So this is not a new idea in some ways. But, you know, my whole thesis is we get caught back, we get caught back into trying to follow recipes that aren't working. And so the recipes are being misapplied. I live here in Silicon Valley. Uh, Astro Teller, the head of Google X, is a, is a, is a neighbor. I, I, I know these folks. And I think what happens is we hear the buzzwords, we think we understand the methodologies, we begin, we begin applying them, but we're applying them in the wrong context. I think everyone on this call knows these recipes work, but they work with a clean sheet of paper, not, not trying to force them into a corporate. The corporate's going to reject them. The corporate has been rejecting them. And I think that's what we need to acknowledge. So that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Uh, 24 minutes or so, we did not get interrupted by the alarm. I don't know, they didn't run it on my floor. Probably the best place to go back to is here for Q&A. And I would love to unmute people and shoot the idea down and 
bash on me and tell me, tell me, tell me what your thinking is. Thank Otherwise, you. I'm going to start Hello. calling you out. Hello, can, can you still hear me? Yes. Mark, first of all, thank you so much for your time, okay, in this exciting presentation and thought provoking. This is what we need. Um, that meaning, if we read corporate innovation books, there's a technique called start something way far from your core business. So that, that's not new. Okay. It's, it, it's in the books, right. but usually it, it doesn't happen, right? Usually organizations from my experience, big ones, they start something small, but that smaller organization, it still depends on the Death Star or the, on, on the core business. That's why, that's one of the reasons why it doesn't, it does, it doesn't work. Others try to fund uh, an, an entrepreneur. Here's a seed stage uh, team. Here's, a, uh, here's money, try to do something. Uh, so it, we, we all know this model. So just probably to provoke you, what's the difference here? What's, what's the key difference in, on, on, on starting something new outside of your core business? Partly it's ambition. Again, I, I put these, Hugo, I put these criteria up. Checklist, they, the checklist, doing, yeah. They say, I'm doing this, I know this. I'm saying, are you doing this? Have you orchestrated, do, do you have an ambition to build new billion euro businesses? Is, is that the goal? No, it's not the goal. Okay, then this is not interesting to you. Oh, that is the goal. Okay, I'm, I'm going to build new billion euro businesses. Have you then orchestrated all buy, build, partner, and invest activities together? Well, no, why would I want to do that? You want to do that so you can make the trade-offs. If it's growing very, very fast, I'm going to acquire. If it's growing very, very slow, I can partner or build. And if I put those under one person, I can make the right efficient trade-offs so we're not, we don't have the internal politics. When I set this thing on the side, am I putting the incentives in place to get good people? Remember earlier I said all the recipes don't work. Well, one of them is CVC. Why doesn't CVC work? CVC doesn't work because we don't pay carry to the investors. What does that mean? There's no upside. We pay them a salary. Well, what good investor are you going to get that only makes a salary? CV, right? If you want to compete with Sequoia and Andreessen Horowitz and Kleiner and Greylock and, and First Round and all the good investors and you want to pull them onto your team, you have to pay carry. But no corporate will pay carry because the VC team could make more than the CEO. No, your point is quite easy to understand is have, yeah. a, have a kid and let the parent die. <laughs> I'm just have reading your point. Have, have several kids, have yeah. several kids, and the parent over time may die. They're in long, slow decline as it is. Yeah, I, I, I get the idea. By the way, I, I also believe this is probably the... Uh, the best recommendation, because I've seen many of the traditional ways to innovate file. Innovation theater, actually I posted about that yesterday, I think, a list of innovation theater activities, showrooms, innovation labs, people talking about agile, digital transformation, squads, doesn't work. Okay. Let's talk about, let's talk about all these, uh, let's talk about all these uh, startups. What do we know? We know that the failure rate on startups is exceptionally high. You go talk to Kleiner or Andreessen Horowitz or Sequoia. You go talk to the best investors and they'll tell you it's a 10% gain. What corporate, what corporate is going to take a hit of, of, of 90% failures? Let me, let, me, let me add further to that. I argue that when you, when you do all your, your corporate startup dancing, that all you see are the average companies. You don't see good companies. You see average companies. And the reason you see average companies is the good ones by definition are stealth. The good ones by definition don't want to talk to you. They hide from you. The average ones, well, they want distribution. They want brand. They're not that good, right? Did Airbnb partner with the hospitality industry? No. Did WhatsApp partner with the, with the mobile telcos? No, right? The, 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 the big disruptive things sneak into the market. A team of 30 people, 30 people created WhatsApp. And that took billions. There we go. 
all right guys it's the opportunity to to fight back <laughs> and disagree or agree with, with with mark so feel free to unmute who wants to start kevin benedict charlene i can see a few names here who else bruno marto roger vasilis camilla well, all, all, I'm, all I can say is, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed from, uh, from, this, uh, from this presentation. So I, I, I try to start very little uh, from my personal experience. Uh, all I can say is when I would um, present the whole story as it is for a new innovation project to my board, it would be dead in a minute, in, in this second. So I have to like mingle my, my way through, navigate with a lot of bullshitting data and stuff um build a big dream promise something otherwise it's you know i i cannot i cannot tell the how risky it is uh, i cannot tell how risky it is otherwise it's you know it's it's it, it, they kill it immediately um it's it's and exactly because um how mark explained it it's just too risky for the core business it's just not their mentality they cannot they, they, they don't want to deal with it i mean they um, <laughs> Some of them um, already see the retirement on the horizon. It's not so far away. Why the hell should they? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we don't talk about it because I think this is equivalent to uh, telling ourselves that we are going to die or telling our grandmother or grandfather, you are going to die. Uh, we don't like death. That, that, that's the thing. We, we like to think that we are invincible, we can live forever. So there's a way to come up with something better without destroying uh, every, everything. And, and I think with Mark's presentation is a bit um, telling the truth. Uh, because in, in, in Mark told us that there are only a handful of cases where that internal disruption, it kind of worked. I'm thinking about Microsoft, for instance, because they, they, with Bill Gates, they, they went you know, to the sky, really successful, powerful. Then with Steve Ballmer, I think st things started to decline. Uh, and with the new CEO, with Satya Nadella, he uh, helped Microsoft to become a trillion dollar company, one, one of the few three or four out there. So he was able to do that from, from, from the inside, pivoting from selling licenses uh, to selling uh, online, online, online services, subscription model, what which was Kind of disruptive to many uh, players in, in, in the markets. Um, but is it about the right leadership? Meaning with the right leader, we can transform the core. We can have 70% of the employees we have at the moment and take them to the future. Or it isn't the leadership. And in some cases, and by the way, can we identify those cases? We will exploit the core until the, until the limit, and then we accept that the company will die. Um, Hugo, um, unfortunately, it's not letting me turn back on my video. I've tried several times. Let I, me, I it's my fault. Let me try to find the button here. No, but I can, I can hear you, but I just can't turn my video back on it. I get an error message every time. Uh, can, you, let's try this again. can you try now? There we go. Yeah, there we go. Can you see me? Yes. Here's the pro here, here's exactly the problem. The problem, you know, the problem with the bottleneck, right? Yeah. The problem's at the top. <laughs> it's a bottleneck. <laughs> uh, there's a quote about that somewhere. Um, but the, the bottleneck, the, the choke is at the top. And these are the people that have been around the business the longest. They allegedly have the most experience what to do. Take, take a typical European multinational. The CEO will be 57 to 61 years old. They will be making anywhere between five and 15 million euros a year. They have probably announced that they're gonna be leaving in the next two years. They've signaled that uh, to, the, to the shareholders. And now you have 10 people to report to that CEO. What do they do? They're gonna be pretty darn risk adverse. Nobody's going to take on anything too disruptive. Nobody's going to take on big ideas because five of those 10 are probably going to be bona fide candidates as a successor. And so the last thing you want to do is, is take on risk. You want to look good for the next two years. You want to deflect risk 
You want to you want to give it to the other person. Let them let them run with the bomb in their hand for a while. And 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 so if for this model to really work, you have to find a CEO that he or she is they meet two criteria. They're young enough in 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 their tenure as CEO or Geschäftsfu or MD whatever you want to call them. They're young enough in their career, they might be, they might have been appointed CEO a year or two ago, they might be in their mid 40s, but they're young enough that they know that they don't take some action and they're in this role for 10 years, there's gonna be problems. So they have the, the so-called halo effect, right? They're new and they can go do bolder things. And then secondarily, they're physically probably younger and they're also in their 40s and they have a different mindset uh, about about change and transformation and reinvention of a business. So I know I know one very large European bank. They meet the first criteria, not the second criteria. So this very large bank has a new CEO. That's good news. The bad news is I think he's sixty three. So well, I, I predict yeah. for that bank it'll be more of the same. We, I think we all know how, how it goes. You know, you are absolutely right. And, 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 and the clarity that you are bringing here to the cafe is something we should say thank you because we don't talk about these things at work. We don't talk about this because we are like, oh, I need to protect my job. I need to protect my, my promotion. I'm not going to disagree regardless of the level where you are, unless you are a bit crazy like myself and uh, <laughs> I might, I disagree quite often. Um, so I, I completely agree, but is it, are you trying to say that somehow it's impossible to help a big old clunky organization to become innovative again? I'm saying that you can do all kinds of incremental work right let's do a design thinking course let's do some cx research let's let's go play with startups i i, I can think of a hundred things we can do let's come next time we travel let's come back out to silicon valley and meet you know let's go to google and get instagram photos of the cafeteria and the you know whatever yeah. 200 tours 200 tours a week come to silicon valley before covid so I used to count them, right? And yeah, I said, yeah, like sure, sure. yeah, exactly. Kumbaya, all that stuff, right? And then, okay, next year, let's go to Israel. Next year, let's go to China. Like every major European country has a consultancy that does, does innovation tourism. Right? And I'll give you the list if you want it sometimes. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're all out there. It's a line of business, by the way. It's a line of business. It's a line of business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a Dutch group. There's a Belgian group. There's, there's, in fact, a lot of countries have several of them, more than one. Uh, and so my, my view is the, the, life, the life of an innovation consultant is a long life if you're happy to do incremental innovation and the organization is happy to do inno incremental innovation and nobody cares about the long-term strategic growth and viability of the business. Now, some, some of that's the- That's what we're doing today. Some of our organizations, uh, we all read the same books, right? So yeah, yeah, incremental product team does that pretty well. Others are trying via M&A to buy some H2, H3 agents that are disruptive for organizations, early stage. Um, so there are, in fact, companies here in Europe running a portfolio of different bets in different horizons, okay? Uh, and, not just incremental, that's what I'm trying to do. So. Right, and by the way, I don't even, I mean, incremental innovation to me is kind of an oxymoron. Um, I, I just think of it as doing your job. <laughs> yes, exactly, but it's not clear, it's not clear. Yeah, now- People do their job, they, they just protect today, you don't, don't think about even tomorrow. And that's beyond this kind of futuristic. It's about the quarter, the month by itself. Yeah. So in, even incremental is kind of futuristic from some organizations. And Hugo, when I look at that Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 activity, which I do know some ambitious companies try to take on, my view is the overwhelming mistakes they still make is they're only thinking of one business unit. They're only thinking of the core business 
They're not structuring this as providing every opportunity for that edge portfolio of businesses to grow. See, if, if I have a portfolio of edge businesses, again, everyone on this call knows the recipe. I want to give those people equity. Let's give them equity. Why not? Let's, and let's not bring them into the core. Why would we want to bring a high growth asset into a low growth environment that has a very, very different set of operational metrics? Makes no sense. I mentioned AXA, AXA Next, N-E-X-T. You can Google it. You'll find some information about it. Uh, they're doing exactly this. And they said to their entrepreneurs, well, they said they, said they, they did a, a 130,000 people in, in AXA globally. You all know them as the French insurance group. They have logos in every high street in, in major cities in Europe, as you know. They said, hey, we're doing this portfolio of startups on the side. We think there's about 60 different spaces we need to go into. Some are in insurance and some are in healthcare and some are in automotive and transport, but it's a very broad remit. We are looking for people to come help us build these companies. When you come over here and help us build these companies, I have some good news. And the good news is I'm gonna give you equity. I'm gonna give you a lot of equity that if it's successful, you're gonna be a rich person. Here's the bad news. We need, we need to adjust your salary down a little bit. The, 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 the equity is lucrative, but, but we can't pay. We're not, we're not gonna pay you like a typical series A startup and you're gonna have to live on 50,000 a year for three years. It's not that bad, but we need to adjust the risk profile and your salary needs to come down because what they decided internally was this is going to be a vote on who really is entrepreneurial or not. Are they, are they prepared to walk away from the comfort of a higher salary and with the expected benefit of a, of a startup, not just talk about it. And then the second piece of bad news is uh, the, the, the Viking approach, burn the ships. There's no job to go back to. So even there's no job to go back to, but I'm putting your destiny in your hands. I'm giving you a sizable piece of equity. By the way, they even said for many of these, it was non-dilutive equity. So you're gonna be protected on, on subsequent rounds. So I'm gonna give you a nice big chunk of equity. I'm gonna give you all of the, uh, the assets of a giant company in terms of partnering and brand and distribution. Let's keep them separate. We're not gonna smother you, but we'll create a distribution partnership if you want it, because we do that with any other startup, right? But, but you're going to have a lot of freedom. If you believe in the upside, if you believe in this business, if you meet that profile, and no surprises, they had some people come across, but, but it really weeded out those that talked about being an entrepreneur and innovation and those that signed up for it. And uh, yeah, you know, who on this, who on this call would, would take a, a 40 or 50% pay cut for the probability of a 10x return in five years. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, that was- you know, the that internal was, challenge. What, what about the external challenge as well? Shareholder value and, th and things like that. That's why so many CEOs, some of them, and I, I know a few, they really want to do something different and better, but they are worried about the fiscal year and how the market will yeah. interpret failure let's say, in fighting the next big thing. That's why many CEOs, regardless of their age, behave like, like they behave in board of directors, etc. There's the market and the pressure in stock price and things like that. They need to begin educating their investors, their shareholders. They need an IR strategy, an uh, investor relations strategy that begins painting this picture. We need to balance near-term profitability with long-term viability. We need to create a mix. And we, we know this, again, we know this from watching other companies. Remember, go back, go back uh, 20 years when Google did their own IPO and, and they filed their papers to go public, the so-called S1 document. And Sergey and Larry very clearly said in that, they said, do not just 
measure us on short-term results. Measure us uh, in the long term. We're going to make financial decisions that you may not agree with, but we, but we know we need to balance short term with the long term, and therefore we're gonna make longer term bets. They said this very openly in their public registration document, do not buy our shares if you want us to maximize short term profits. We saw almost the identical language when Facebook went public. And Facebook went public in a desktop world right when, when mobile phones were taking off. And they said, we don't know how to make money in mobile phones. We know it's our future. We know we need to invest and do some experimentation to get the mobile experience right. But right now, we don't know how to make money in mobile phones. Do not buy our stock if you're looking for short-term profit maximization because we don't know how we're going to do it. We, 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 we are, our revenue model is around desktop. We know desktop is going to go down as, as mobile goes up. Uh, we may need to make some strategic acquisitions, but do not judge us. So we know there's a pattern, and you start if you start with a clean sheet of paper, if you look at this edge organization as a clean sheet of paper, you can sell IR, you can sell your employees, you can sell your leadership team, go run the core business. It, it has long-term headwinds. You know, you need to build a case for action. It's got long-term problems, and 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 if, if we are, are really stewards of our shareholders for the next 10 or 15 years, we have to go place lots and lots and lots of small bets unencumbered by all the corporate bullshit. Uh, that's the answer. But, uh, but we've been fighting and trying to push all of our innovation stuff inside that corporate core. And, and, and that, that was my message today. That's not working. Any comments, guys? How can we explain all of these to the CEO without getting fired? <laughs> I saw said, hands, uh, I saw hands go up. They told all... me people are risk takers. I think, I think we as an industry need to begin speaking the truth or throw me under the bus. I don't care. I'll go to talk to your CEO. I mean, I'm happy to explain that Focusing on the incremental stuff is necessary, but insufficient. It is. And, 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 and look at, look at all those things. That's why the world needs consultants to tell the truth. Uh, but yeah, consultants, they, somehow, don't, no, they, they, they don't, they don't tell the they truth. They don't tell the truth enough, unfortunately. They no. don't. Because they are it's, selling T&M, time and materials. Sure. Instead of, uh, I'm worried about outcomes and I will get my money from the outcomes or a percentage of the outcomes. I know there's a Japanese consulting firm called Kaizen, and they get their money from the, the, the gains, okay? Meaning if they optimize, they get a share. If they help the company to grow, they get a share. It's I've heard it's this companies Kaizen, consulting firm said, experiment with this for 30 years. It's a, it's a wonderful idea. It's extremely difficult to put into practice. First of all, the variables that affect the gains are in the hundreds, if not thousands. How many variables really will produce my profitability this quarter or this year? And, and then it becomes one of, if they go for the big prize, you get your full bonus. If they're more risk adverse and go for the 50% prize and still bank something, you get a much smaller bonus. So how do you, how, how do you, you know, I, I've seen this my whole career, companies trying to, consulting firms trying to crack this one. I would love to see it cracked, uh, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I wish we could crack it as an industry. Um, hi, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, I can. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. um, just a quick question. Basically, like, um, I don't have, like, experience. I'm a student myself, so everything is, like, new to me in a sense. Um, but uh, when we are talking about digital transformation and everything, isn't that a big part of the culture as well? Like if the top management culture in the company is set to, let's say, defend from change, how can this kind of companies go forward, if that makes sense? Thank you. Again, uh, it's, there are 5,000 companies around the world with at least 1 billion euro in revenue, roughly 5,000. 
And I believe the market for an idea like this is maximum 15 or 20% of those 5,000. This is not a positive message for those 5,000 companies. 80%, Vasilis, 80% are gonna be in the camp you just described. It's a 58 or 59 year old CEO who's most, li most likely, he's uh, what they call pale, male and stale, right? Most likely. And, and sometimes he's, he, it's a female, but largely pale, male, and stale. And they're defending, they're defending their legacy. If they're leaving in 24 months, they're not gonna bet on a bigger strategy like this. So the 15 or 20% that are on the lower end of a, of a newer CEO and a younger CEO, that's where you're gonna find the market for this. Somebody that's a little open, more open to new ideas. That's, that's where I focus and, and my work right now with several European multinationals, that's effectively my target. But the 80%, if, if, if you know, I, I, the, the sad part when I talk about the, the pale, male and stale problem, the sad part is go look at the supervisory board and the supervisory board typically has eight or 10 years of seniority on the CEO's age and they don't get much equity in a European model. They don't even, their, their incentives to be stewards of the shareholders isn't borne out in the compensation policy we give them. We give them cash. Here's a, here's a novel idea, let's give them equity. Don't give them cash, give them equity. And let, let's see if they can, because that, that will align their interests with the interests of of the shareholders, right? But we pay them cash. We need to pay our we need to pay our supervisory board in equity only. Pay them big piles of equity, and then let's see who's tall enough for the ride. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. But sadly, yeah, actually, call, we, yeah, go we ahead. Can call this we can call it uh, this presentation the ugly truth about corporate innovation. <laughs> it's a more catchy title because this is it. I, I agree. With, with, with you, uh, but the challenge we all face is, um, even if we think like you, it's very, very hard to convince decision makers that they need to act in a different way, and of course, shareholders. And we can't just educate the markets. Uh, and that's why I think the Innovation Cafe project is kind of cool, because we can talk about this, we can share this to the world, and if, if we, if we change the mindset, I think it can really help organizations instead of just selling innovation theater services, because we don't want, we also don't want innovation theater. We want to help organizations, but to do that, we need to be able to be honest, honest with ourselves and with the clients. That's, that's the thing. But we also know it's not easy because usually they pay for our time, okay? It's the whole model and incentive system that needs to, to, to change, so yeah. Hugo, let me give you, um, and, and, and all the, the, the viewers today, uh, let me give you a real simple model. I've been using this model my entire career. I, I, as I said earlier, I lived most of the 90s in Europe, trying to affect large scale change in multinationals. When I, when I try to change a company, I, I think of three things that all have to be done in parallel and together. The first thing you have to do is create enough uh, uh, urgency that, that, that you have to change the status quo, that you have to uh, change the existing business in some way. You have to provide enough evidence that business as usual is, is unacceptable. It's not going to be good if we continue down this path. So don't go into the, the theater and yell fire. But what I call create discomfort with the status quo. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. Second thing you need to create is a, is a compelling vision, a compelling future state. What, what does this thing look like in five years? Uh, describe it in financial terms, de 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 describe it in emotional terms, describe it in operational terms. But what does this, what does this future state look like in five years we're trying to get to? And then, build a bridge between the current state and the future state. 
everyone needs a model like this and work those three variables in parallel to say, A, we have it, no, one, we have enough discomfort with the status quo. Two, we've created a compelling future that should be a magnet to attract people towards. That's a compelling financial future. That's a compelling uh, personal future for, for everyone in the organization. That's a great place to get to. That's a, that's a goal worth achieving. And then number three, this, the psychological safety. How are we going to get from today's discomfort to this future state? And, and those three things need to be worked in parallel all the time and, and informed by all the conversations we're having with leadership and executives. And if, if any of those three pieces aren't in place, you're not going to change a company. Any more comments, guys? Feel free to unmute. Yeah, okay. Roger and Charlene have been very quiet. So is Ricardo. I can jump in with something, but if Charlene or Roger or somebody wants to go in first, go for it. They are still in shock. They are like, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is at a higher level than I've ever worked at. Right. I mean, my background is doing crazy things for medium sized companies as opposed to trying to affect change at the senior level of major companies. So I'm kind of thinking I'm not really sure I know what I'm talking about here, but I'm seeing a theoretical problem that, you know, if I think back to a lot of the people that I've worked at, some of the most impressive work on a kind of project or program level that I've seen is from people who go, I don't really care if you fire me. I'm going to do this because this is going to get awesome results. And they basically get on with it until someone fires them. And very often they'll get fantastic results and they don't really get rewarded for that because they made waves and occasionally they get fired. Now, over a kind of 30 year career, I can imagine large companies, you weed out all the people willing to make those decisions, which is kind of a similar thing to what you've been saying about, you've got the CEO who's only got two years left and he wants to get his 15 million a year. But I kind of wonder if what you're asking for is by definition impossible because the moment you ask for somebody to be accountable to board level and have a large enough budget that they're actually going to care about it, then immediately all of those issues come into play and everyone gets risk averse and nobody wants to be responsible for the failure and nobody wants the bad press. And I kind of wonder if there's almost an alternative model, which is, you know, sowing lots of seeds and letting a thousand flowers grow to use a completely inappropriate analogy um, and trying to get that seeded within multiple little departments rather than the monolithic sort of innovation lab skunk works etc which is then subject to the ceo's oversight could you somehow see the hundred little things across the organization that are all too small for ceo to even notice and where people have the freedom to execute when they're still at the point in their career where they can go do you know what i don't care fire me but i'm going to do this because it's going to be awesome kevin uh very very insightful and, and percipient thank you the the you know let a thousand flowers bloom if you do that inside the existing core organization it all falls back to being incremental right you're, you're not that's the problem you're not going to be able to do big crazy things big disruptive things something that may tip the apple cart um i did have to mute out a half an hour ago when the alarm was going off and my point was uh whatsapp which everyone on this call has used today was 30 people, every major mobile operator saw it. Every major mobile operator had the resources to beat it. But the Votive team out in Newbury, the Orange team in Paris, the T-Mobile team or the, the, the Deutsche Telekom team in Bonn, many of these have been my clients, they all saw it, but they failed to act. And they failed to act because in large organizations, it's easier to be wrong together than right alone. Nobody wants to be right alone in a big company. It's easier to be wrong together. And so we're, we were all wrong at, at, at Voda. But what the, the reality is somebody at Voda, I'll pick on Voda. I know we have a few uh, people from the UK on the phone today, or most of you are. Newbury saw WhatsApp, but some senior person had P&L for SMS messaging. They're not gonna let you, they're, they're not gonna let you attack that revenue. Their bonus, and the bonus for every direct report to that head of SMS messaging says, like hell, you're gonna attack that. So 
So we don't work on the, we work on the urgent, we don't work on the important. And in the core, that's the problem. We work on the urgent, not the important. And so the, the I, I like that analogy, let a thousand flowers bloom, but we need to do that on the edge. And we need to give equity to those people that do that. And we need to pay CDC carry and we, and we don't need to encumber them, right? Otherwise the, 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 the thousand flowers bloom becomes incremental. Um, those kinds of programs exist already um, for, if you want to look at it, Adobe created a program called Redbox. I think they call it Redbox and Swisscom and others copied it. Like if you have an idea, here's a hundred euros and we'll stage gate it. And if you're successful at the next stage, we'll give you 500 euros. And if you're successful at the next stage, we'll give you 2000 euros. We don't even track the money. And they, they've been hundreds of those and what they lead to are incremental. But they, they've actually saved Adobe because they were selling licenses before. Right. And their growth went wild uh, with the subscription model. So that's probably uh, a good example that is possible. But you might say, might argue, okay, but it's, it's software. They changed the revenue model, but it's software end of the day. And something will replace what they are doing, maybe. But they were able to do that. They were shipping boxes with licenses, you know, in the CD-ROM, and they pivoted to that subscription model and their growth rate went to the moon. So, I, and the same with Microsoft, they were shipping licenses, right? And then cloud, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, Azure and all of that, with a new CEO, not with Steve Ballmer, they were able to pivot to a new micro, Microsoft. That's why they are a trillion dollar company. But your point is still valid because you mentioned yeah there are a, there's a handful of companies where they were able to do good things but all others are still playing around with innovation theater i also think that we are improving the core the design thinking and all the cool design services in a better way or at least we we smile a lot more because we are using post-its and mirror boards and things like that so it's kind of more of a it's it's more fun than using a visio and all of those tools and boring meetings but your point is still, is still valid. It's not enough. And I agree with that, completely agree with that. One yeah, final question, because we are running out of time, sorry. We're spending tens of billions of euros globally on this thing called innovation, and we can't find case studies where a company is transformed. We can't find uh, enough for one hand. You know, there's a problem in the industry. I completely agree. Something needs to, to, to change. And I think the opportunity is now in this post COVID-19 world where many big, old, slow are in deep pain. Okay. So I think the opportunity is, is now. I'm 100% with, with you. Any final question or questions before we go out to a pub or something like that? <laughs> please, please also email me and tell me where you where I need to strengthen this argument. I've got uh, four researchers right now helping me on a book project around this whole notion. So what would you need to see, you know, further on this? Um, like I said, four researchers, I'm happy to keep them busy. We're doing quite a bit of financial modeling and some other things. So um, hey, did you look at this company? Did you look at this sector? Did you think about this? Um, this was only an hour today, but I, I'm, I could speak for days on this topic. There's, there's quite a bit to unpack here and I'm always open for suggestions how to, how to improve the argument or what else to look at to, to consider. Mark, we are on Slack. We are a group of 250 uh, innovation practitioners uh, from 15 different or 16 time zones across the world. Great. So feel free to join our, uh, the Slack and maybe with co-creation or whatever, you might find a few followers to help you or use it as a, I don't know, to survey, to wh whatever. Feel free to join. I think that's uh, something you can do right now. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, well, I'm already in the Slack group and we are doing an innovation survey uh, so just very broadly around some of these topics. All right, but if you feel free to post every single day and uh, help me to grow the community as well. I think we need more. I need more help. So if anyone else wants to step up, this is my personal in invite as well. All right, Mark, thank you so much for this thought provoking presentation. It was pretty thank you all. You've been all generous with your time and uh, 
appreciate uh, this going in your evening. And Hugo, next time I'm in uh, the UK, let's get together and whoever can make it, we'll, we'll gr grab a beer and catch up. It's going to be called the Innovation Pub instead of the Innovation Cup. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, all. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.